Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Ron Kisen Stevenson. Tonight I'd like to talk about right thought and the foundations of mindfulness. The Eightfold Path is something that we as Buddhists have that can help us in our lives to evolve in our spiritual journeys. Um, the second step of the Eightfold Path, of course, is right thought. The first is right vision or right aim. Now, obviously, we need a fundamental point of departure or direction in our journey, um, a fundamental framework of understanding, and that's set forth in the Four Noble Truths. This is the understanding that our mental suffering is caused by identification with objects, and of course, that we attach to them, and they're impermanent, and we lose them. So the clinging to them and their inevitable loss and the dread uh, of anticipatory fear uh, constitute what we call dukkha in life or dissatisfaction. So right aim is pretty much the resolution to overcome that suffering. Well, the Pali Sutras emphasize the Four Noble Truths as a means of personal salvation. In other words, salvation from personal suffering rather than compassion for all beings. Uh, so it's been referred, of course, uh, referred to as Hinayana, the lesser vehicle. By contrast, Mahayana has been called the greater path because it focuses a lot on compassion for all sentient beings. However, I would like to point out that there is no inherent contradiction in the two. Ultimately, there's no separation between self and other. Unless we're able to get our own mind straight, there is no way to help others. So self-care is an absolute prerequisite for the care of others. So right thought then means getting our own mental processes straightened out so that the other practices on the Eightfold Path can then become possible. And a better understanding of human psychology in general, which we may gain partly from self-introspection, can help us understand others better as well. And we can be in a better position to help. And that's why right thought matters. Now, thought itself, of course, is an automatic function of mind, and so it can't be either right or wrong. So right thought really implies that we become aware of our mental processes and know which to follow and which are not worth following. We can have a skillful approach to our thoughts and feelings rather than just haphazardly going along and allowing them to dominate us at every turn. We can examine our habitual thought patterns to better understand what they are where they arise from, what their original purposes were, and if they are still useful or not. Uh, we can evaluate whether we still need the behaviors or whether they become hindrances or dysfunctional patterns. And yes, we do have a lot of habitual uh, patterns, do we not? Uh, we're triggered by all sorts of things, certain words, people, uh, political thoughts, beliefs, Sometimes we don't even know why we're triggered by something. And one reason is that our earliest conditioned responses were formed when we were too immature to have the mental pro processes to understand or process them. As infants, for example, we would not have any real memory of trauma because the hippocampus in the brain which encodes memory had not yet developed. So you would not have an actual explicit memory of a triggering event. However, there is implicit memory, which means that these triggers become encoded in our biology rather than through our conceptual thinking minds, uh, which were still in the process of developing. And as a result, we're often reacting to old programs that we're not even conscious of and um, having maladaptive behaviors as a result. 
And because it is so hard to identify these, uh, we can't really confront them or deal with them. The way we adopt early stress is useful in helping us to endure unbearably stressful situations early in life. But the same adoptive strategies become sources of pathology, threatening our health, both mentally and physically. And our brain development as children is impacted as well. A child's development depends on parents who are available, consistently emotionally available, non-stressed and responsive to his needs. Any hindrance or disruption to these things will actually impact brain development. I'd like to talk about uh, psychologist Gabor Mate for a moment. He emphasizes the fact that the emotions and biology are inseparable. He puts it this way, what you lose emotionally translates into biological events. So uh, Dr. Mate was diagnosed with ADHD at the age of 53, which is quite a late age. The behaviors he identified at the time were tuning out, inattentiveness, and removing oneself from the situation. This is dissociation. Now I can also identify with these behaviors. We are all on a spectrum. Now, how did he come to develop this? Well, when Gabor was a two month old infant, his mother handed him to a stranger on the streets of Budapest. Now his mother was Jewish and she gave him up to save his life. Gabor was then separated from her for several months. She was in a, a, a work camp. Now, obviously he couldn't have any actual recollection of this event at such an early stage. Again, the hippocampus of the brain was not yet developed, but an implicit unconscious memory of abandonment became so deeply encoded that many years later, he recalls an incident where he just flew into an inexplicable rage when his wife was unable to pick him up at an airport. So what would you do as an infant at this early stage separated from your mother? And how do you react even today to triggering stressful events? Well, first you could confront the situation, which is uh, fight or flight. Second, if that's not available, you could ask for help. But what if you were unable to do any of these things? You wouldn't deal with it, your brain would. <clears throat> your brain would employ a number of different defense mechanisms. And dissociation is one example I gave. The brain opts out of the intolerable situation by making you tune out the stress. But as a young child, you're tuning out at a time when millions of brains connections are being made every minute. As a result, that temporary behavior becomes encoded as a personality trait. An implicit memory of abandonment gets encoded. This memory or feeling misinforms the adult's logic and warps our perception of what we encounter. It causes us to engage in unskillful thinking and actions throughout our lives. Now, the child <clears throat> is reacting just automatically to the stress of its environment. And that is, of course, primarily its mother. Mate points out that as children, we are purely narcissistic in the sense that whatever we experience is all about us. Regardless of what our mother's going through or the circumstances, all we know is I was rejected. I was not wanted. Now, a narcissistic personality in adulthood is an individual so deeply traumatized as a child that validation seeking has become a lifelong obsession and career. Narcissistic personality disorder is just an extreme example of an adaptation mechanism that becomes a dysfunctional mental state. <clears throat> of course, there's many such coping mechanisms, 
Gabor Mate, for example, became a physician. He reasoned that if I'm not wanted, I'll make myself needed. And he became a workaholic, and as a result, his own children developed ADHD from that neglect, that sense of abandonment, and the, dysfunction, the dysfunctional mental patterns became intergenerational. Now, our Zen Buddhist practice offers us another functional strategy, introspection. It isn't logical or conceptual, but then again, neither are our encoded thought patterns. They are deeply biologically encoded. So our practice takes us where logic cannot go. It teaches us to regard our arising thoughts and feelings dispassionately, to encounter them, be curious about them, but not engaged and wrapped up in them. And through that, we learn what these patterns are. We understand our programmed responses that arose to, in response to past trauma, and we can put them into perspective. So by definition, we are no longer hostage to them. Now in koan practice, in the koan, we transcend our habitual thought patterns and we can see more clearly into the nature of how they arise. And we no longer mistake mental programs for something substantial, enduring or essential. But arguably, I think the greatest tool that the Buddha taught was mindfulness or sati. The foundations of mindfulness starts with noting the sensations of the body. Contemporary psychology has been deeply influenced by this. This includes such modalities as somatic body experiencing, of which Peter Levine is the leading progenitor, internal family systems therapy, IFS, and EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. These forms of mindfulness practice have deep roots in this Buddhist tradition, which is about 2,600 years old. And it started when the Buddha exhorted his senior bhikkhus to train their students in the four foundations of mindfulness. Now, sati is translated as mindfulness or bare attention or conscious attention. The four foundations of mindfulness are mindfulness of bodies, feelings, minds, and dharmas or, or phenomena. Practitioners were encouraged to meditate on these four at every stage of the path. Uh, here, what the Buddha said in the sutta is this, dwell contemplating the body in the body. In order to know the body as it really is, dwell contemplating feelings in feelings, in order to know feelings as they really are. And the same with mind in mind and dharma in dharmas. Now, when the Buddha tells us to see the body in the body, he's exhorting us to recognize that the body is a collection of parts that's impermanent, ultimately unsatisfactory and selfless. That's just the nature of the body as it really is. Also, by investigating bodily sensations, we can experience stress that's encoded biologically and physically. Working with the body in psychology in this way provides great insights into the feelings and implicit memories that people are holding. And also focus on bodily sensations in themselves can be a gateway for awareness and insight. Mindfulness of feeling. Second, the Buddha tells us to be aware of the feelings in the feelings. By learning to abide with our feelings, rather than allowing ourselves to be swept away into these dis dysfunctional patterns, we can learn to unwind these connections formed in response to early stressors. Paying attention to the way each thought arises, 
remains present and passes away, we learn to stop reacting. Third, the Buddhist tells us to see the mind in the mind. Um, consciousness in Buddhist thinking arises from moment to moment. It arises on the basis of inflows from our senses and our internal mental states, such as our memories, our imaginings, and feelings coming from implicit memories. If we cling to a thought, we proliferate it into more and more complex thoughts. And that only reinforces the implicit conditioning and makes it worse. So paying attention to the way the thoughts arise, we can stop that runaway train of one dissatisfactory thought leading to another and to another. And finally, he tells us to practice mindfulness of dharma in dharmas or phenomena. So the Buddha might be saying here that the dharma that we contemplate is within us. When the Buddha sat beneath the Bodhi tree, it's written that he recalled all his past lives. In psychological terms, that means he had penetrating insight into past reactive patterns with which he had identified. The identification turns each thought into a little self, a thought pattern that's been preventing us from being here and now. And also before awakening, the Buddha overcame the temptations and the armies of the mythical god Mara. The psychological voices and impulses in our heads demanding our attention. They're like forces of gravity pulling us back into their agenda. And once the Buddha had dealt successfully with all these conflicting agendas, he had awakened. In IFS therapy, something called parts work gives attention to all these internal voices and the individual can learn to identify and address differences in, and conflicts in the so-called agendas of these different parts. And those can be responsible for gridlock in our, our emotional hearing, uh, healing. Richard Swartz describes the goal of IFS therapy as, I quote, enabling the individual to resolve conflicts between parts so that the person can live life from its core self which is compassionate, wise, and confident. A core self, which is compassionate and wise. That does sound a lot like what we Buddhists call our essential nature. So in conclusion, you're probably familiar with the expression by now in Buddhism that you don't need to believe everything you think. And that's certainly good news. We don't need to be mindlessly strung along by arising thoughts and mental programs. Instead, if we approach our thoughts mindfully, they can give us some very valuable information about ourselves that our minds cannot. Thank you.